Hello, hello. Good morning. We just prayed, but I can't preach without praying, so we're going to pray again. Dear Lord, Father God, I thank you that, that you're too good, too good to not believe in, Jesus. I've seen too much, Father. I've seen too much goodness. I've seen situations that seemed impossible and you came through in faithfulness. I've seen the power of your presence change lives. Jesus, you are too good to not believe in. Too good to not surrender to. Too good to not give a whole life up for. Jesus, because in the same way you you looked at us, you said, they're too good not to die for. I created them in my image and I want relationship. It's, it's, It's not... It's not going to work for me to let them go, to let them stay in sin. I have to die for my children. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you're so good. I pray that your presence would come here today. Jesus, that your tangible presence would enter this room. Some of us have never felt that, experienced that, don't know what that looks like, but we open up our hearts to it, Lord. I pray that you would move through this room, that you would touch each and every heart. Jesus' name, amen. Is, do I sound all right? Okay. Because it's like echoing in my head, and I didn't know if you guys heard that also. Welcome to Salem Community Church. Um, I'm your pastor, Nathan Pearson. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not. I'm half his age, but twice as good looking, some may say. No, he's, he's a great guy. I love Nathan. He's on his honeymoon right now. Um, Kristen, it's his wife. God bless her. We're going to have a prayer service after church specifically for her um, and for the rest of her life because we're a little concerned. But no, I'm so happy to be here. I love this church. I love this family. Can I tell you the truth? today. I'm scared to death because I'm up here preaching to you guys, right? I don't have the right words. I'm not a theologian. I don't know all the right things. I have no qualifications, but one thing I do have, and that's the Spirit of God. And that one thing can take every disqualification and qualify. We've seen it time and time again in the scriptures. People disqualify themselves. People sin. People run away. But you know what? Only the presence of God qualifies people, equips people, sends people, changes a whole world. So that's what I want to share with you today. I want to catch you up a little bit on my life. Last January, I would say, I'm going to start by confessing, I I got into this season where I got lazy spiritually. I didn't set aside the time to spend intimate time with Jesus, right? And it started off as just laziness, but what that turned into was it was, it sowed seeds for sin. So I, so I fell asleep spiritually. And then I fell into sin. I, I began to take my things, my head off of the things of God, and I, I put them on the things of the earth, on the things of the world. And I'm a senior in college. How can I get the best job? How can I make the most money? How can I have a big house one day? How can I own a Tesla? Zero to 60 in 1.8 seconds, the Roadster 2.0. How can I get that one day? It's only 200 grand. So I put my, my sights, I put my, my head and my heart on those things and off the things of God. And what happened is 
it causes spiritual death. You see, when you sow seeds of sin, no matter what it is, how simple, it will bear fruit. Your life will always bear fruit. Your life will always bear fruit. So the, the fruit that I began to harvest was bitterness. The fruit that I began to harvest was anger. The fruit that I began to harvest was anxiety and fear. And so I met with, um, I'm part of a campus ministry. It's called Chi Alpha at Austin P State University. And our pastor there, his name is Jonathan Miller. And he said, Garrett, you've been on my heart lately. I want to meet with you. I said, okay. Is this working? So I met with him, and I was like, I knew, you know, he's a real spiritual guy. I was like, please don't bring up where I am in life right now. But <laughs> we were sitting there, and he said, Garrett, you know, last fall when you came to Austin P, I I saw you explode with life. And I saw you chasing after the Lord. And he saw, I saw this fruit in your life, but I don't see any right now. He saw a barren tree without fruit, and I sat there, and I put my head down, because I knew that it was true. I knew that that peace that my life was producing was, wasn't there anymore. I knew that the love that I had for others that just burst within me and that I was pouring out on those around me wasn't there anymore. We're always sowing seeds, and I was sowing seeds of bitterness. I was sowing seeds of anger. I was sowing seeds of selfishness. This has happened a couple times in my life. I've gone from having my eyes set on the things of Jesus to what can I do to serve myself? And I would make myself and my appetite God. When I was 16 or 15 years old, I don't know, we went to Belize here at Salem. It was my first ever mission trip. And there was one night, it was dark, and there was a, a concrete like pier that went out into the water. And I walked out there, and I was like, hey, God. And I feel like in my spirit, he was like, hey. Because I think that's how the Father talks. He talks just gentle, and he invites us into space. He said, hey, this is what I have for your life. So I went home, and I didn't know what that meant, but I was like, okay, I'll go on a mission trip once, twice a year, whatever. I'll go back the next year, and I'll walk out onto that same pier, and the wind's blowing, and I look up. He says, hey, son, this is what I have for you. And so it started in my own hello, hello, hello. Hello? Hello. So what started in my life is a love of other cultures, a, a love of missions, you know, just dreaming about the future. And I went off to Asbury and I got off track and I got into trouble and I got sent home. Heard the story probably. And I, I, I get home and I disqualified myself. I said, yeah, he was gonna use me, not anymore. And so I went to my first ministry thing. It was a small group. We call them core groups. And this, this guy I had never met in my whole life. He says, hey, Garrett, have you ever thought about missions? I was like, yes. And he was like, have you ever thought about West Africa? I was like, I have now. <laughs> so I disqualified myself, but... But Jesus, his presence always requalifies, right? We're in a series, that was just the intro. <laughs> We're in a series called People in the Bible You Might Not Know. Pastor Nathan has set it up for us. He's taught us about all sorts of people in the Bible we may have never heard of. And why? He uses this metaphor. He says, listen, a father doesn't hide an Easter egg so that his son can't find it so that his son, to torture his son. He doesn't hide an Easter egg to torture his son, but he hides an Easter egg for the joy that comes when he finds it. And when I was thinking about this series, I thought about a puzzle. If the Bible and the word and, and God and life was a puzzle, when he teaches of us about something that we didn't see that way, he, he shows us a piece of the puzzle and he shows us where it sits and we put it in and 
the image makes more sense. And it's beautiful. So I'm going to teach you, the, the Father's going to teach you, about a character named Eutychus. We're in Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 7, um, going to verse 12. Well, you turn there, I'm going to catch you up. Paul is doing his thing. He's doing his ministry. He's going from place to place, to Macedonia, Syria, Macedonia. He ends up in a place I believe is called Troas, T-R-O-A-S. So he ends up in Troas. And in verse 7, it says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. He prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting in the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But when Paul went down and bent over, taking him in his arms, said, do not be alarmed for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a while longer until daybreak and so departed. And they took the youth away and were not a little comforted. So what do I see from the story? So Paul, He's in this place. He's about to leave the next day. I believe his ministry is winding down. So he's getting his encouragement in, all of his instruction. He's leaving the next day. So he's, I might as well talk through the night. First thing I learned from that, I'm only here for one Sunday. I could talk till three, four, five o'clock. I mean, who knows? No, I'm joking. We'll get out of here. I know how you guys feel. Um, but anyways, let's... <laughs> Let's go through this story. So Paul is with them. He's giving his instruction. They're in this third story, upper room. Eutychus is sitting in a window seal. He's sitting in a window seal. It's, it's night. He's listening to the soothing sound of Paul's voice. Talk about Jesus. Talk about the love of God. And the lights are flickering. And I, there's probably a breeze blowing in from the window. And he begins to get drowsy and he falls asleep. When he falls asleep, he falls out of the window, hits the ground and dies. I see a pattern in this that, that I also see in my life, the story that I shared before. You see, he, he fell asleep. He fell and he died. In my life, I fell asleep spiritually. I fell into sin and I died spiritually. My life no longer bared fruit. It started with just a little laziness. It started with just a little drowsiness spiritually. It led to falling into sin, to, to feeding those things, and then it ended up with a spiritual death. That's what I see in the story. And when I was, I was thinking about this yesterday outside, and I felt the Father take me to a parable in this parable, there's a person with a vineyard and there's a tree year after year, it hasn't bared fruit. And I'm ready to cut this thing down. This thing's taking up space in my vineyard. And the servant said, wait, 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 wait. I will tend to it. I will dig it up. I will fertilize it. I will water it. I will take care of this plant for a whole year. And at the end of the year, if it doesn't bear fruit, you can cut it down. I think the Father, I think Jesus did the same thing in my life. I think he says, hey, 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 I know he appears dead. But just as Paul took Eutychus into his arms and put his ear to his chest, I think the Father did the same thing with my heart. I think he took me up in his arms and I think he put his ear to my chest and said, wait, fear not, for his life is in him. I want to take us now to 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 1 through 11. Now concerning the times and the seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you. 
For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness, so let us not sleep as other do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. In this letter, Paul says, hey, we're not children of the darkness, we're children of the light, so, so be vigilant, don't fall asleep. He, he, he's warning us not to be Eutychus in this moment, not to fall asleep, because if we fall asleep, if we take our eyes from the king, we will fall into sin. And if we fall into sin, we will die spiritually. But we have a loving God. Even if it does happen, he, he comes down and he picks us up and he, he breathes back into us his breath, his life. You see, it's the presence of God. He said, he's not destined us for his wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. getting the opportunity to preach, I realize that I have the obligation to preach the gospel, not just to teach about a character we didn't know, right? That's great. I, it's, it's part of this big puzzle, but we, we always have to be vigilant in preaching the gospel. So I, I just want to do that real quick. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he spoke everything into existence. He spoke to the land. He said, land, separate yourself from the sea. He spoke to the sea. He said, sea, swarm with creatures. He spoke to the air. He said, air, have birds. Fill, fill the sky with birds. And he could have spoke us into existence. But instead, he sat down. And in the clay... He fashioned his own image. The first sculpture in all of history. And he fashioned it after himself. And he breathed life into it. And this, this, this creation and, and him walked in the garden. They, they walked in relationship. And they walked in love each day. They were closer. They were closer than the skin on us. But humanity still chose a different route. We call that different route sin. And like we've talked about, that sin leads to death. And so the father couldn't just leave his children to be out of his presence for all of eternity. He couldn't do it. He loved us too much. He had spent so much time crafting us. I'm a biology major. I learn about different things and how, it's crazy how life is alive. <laughs> it's impossible. It's so intricate. He cared so much about us that he said, you know what? I'm gonna go down there. I'm gonna take on human flesh I'm gonna live a perfect life and I'm gonna die for my children. Last night I was praying and I said, God, I've prepared this sermon, I've practiced a couple times. Each practice has taken 40 or 50 minutes, so please be with the church. Um, and I was praying and I was like, what do you wanna speak? I have this plan, but Lord, I'll give it to you. What do you want? And he said, tell them about my love. Tell them about the Father's love.
this is the gospel, that Jesus would die for us, that the Father would literally chase after us every day. And you see, we were sinners and he died for us. But what's crazy is even after he died for us, we still sometimes go back to sin and he still chases after us each time. And when he finds us, he picks us up and he says, fear not, for his life is still in him and he calls that life back into us. So thankful for the Father's love. A.W. Tozier would put the gospel like this. At the heart of the Christian message is God himself waiting for his redeemed children to push into conscious awareness of his presence. At the heart of the Christian message, at the heart of all of it, we have a God who has redeemed his children and desires those children to walk in his presence, walk with him each and every day. You see, earlier this year, I, I was struggling with anxiety and I held on to this verse in John 14. It says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. Let not your hearts be troubled. And I held on to that and I realized he was saying, that listen, the world will give you things and when you no longer deserve them, it's, it'll strip them from you. The world will give you a great job, but when you no longer perform, it'll strip it away. But listen, my peace and my presence is something that I will never take from you, no matter whether you deserve it or not. And in the first verse of John 14, he said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. So when we're afraid, when we're troubled, what is the answer? Believe in God. He said, how can it be that simple? Believe in God. Faith in God. He, he, he talked to me and I was thinking about the school year and I had anxiety and I was praying. I kept praying. I kept praying. I kept praying. I kept praying. And he said, hey, guess what? <laughs> Your anxiety is the least of what I'm gonna handle and take care of this year. So as I began to surrender and this summer and go back to school and I have my friend Eric here today. Eric, you don't have to stand up. He promised me. He said, don't make me stand up. He didn't even know I was gonna say his name today. But Eric, is a, he's a missionary at Austin P with the campus ministry, Chi Alpha. And this man is so important in my life, right? He's been a mentor, he's been a brother. And at the beginning of this year, he said, hey, I've been designated to reach out and connect with international students. He said, would you like to be a part of that? And ever since I was 16 and I had this burning inside of me for other cultures and other people, I said, yes, yes I will. And then in that moment, I just, I just said, God, would you take this opportunity? God, whatever you want. And what he did was he began to place me opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to, to connect, to, to love on international students, to, to be ministered to by them, to learn part of their language and their culture and their food. Two of my brothers are here today from Nigeria, we have Tega and Kaode, and I love them very much. I'm so glad they're here. Ogena Tega is my man's full name, Ogena Tega. And it means, because in Africa, they don't name you, they don't name you John or whatever. They name you things that have deep meaning. So Ogena Tega means God is worthy to be worshiped. And that's how this man lives his life, right? So thankful for, for what God has done. I'm gonna read one more passage of scripture. Luke 24, 45 through 49. 
Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold, I'm sending you the promise of my father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And Luke, this was his final instructions to his disciples. It's so powerful because he says, hey, you've received salvation, but I have something else. Before you get to work for me, be still. And he said, until I clothe you from power on high. You see, I'm, I'm glad for those of us that have received salvation through Christ, but we must also receive the Holy Spirit or we'll be powerless. And I use this example of Peter. So Peter was one of the disciples. He was close to Jesus and he had so much zeal for God. He wanted to serve God. He said, he even said, the night before Jesus died, he said, Jesus, I will do anything, even up to death. He said, is that so? You're right. You know, one day you will die for me, but tomorrow you'll run away. And so Peter, they, the disciples scattered. Peter ran away. He, he denied his Lord three times. But after the day on Pente of Pentecost, he, they, went to, they went to the city and they stayed there. And sure enough, they were clothed with power on high and they received the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter, that zeal plus the Holy Spirit, preached a message and 3,000 people came to know Jesus. And he went on to do a beautiful ministry and died a death very similar to his Lord's. I'm gonna invite the band back up as we close. can tell I love John 14. Another thing he says in this passage, he said, greater things than this you will do. And you look at the life of Jesus and the, just the things he did and you're like, doesn't sound right. I'm gonna do greater things. I believe what, what Jesus is saying is, Hey, with every generation, I will continue to pursue my children with, with, such, with such power, with such intensity. And those, those that are there in the generation that have surrendered their lives and their hearts to me, I will empower and I will use and I will do greater and greater and greater things. But I will use you. So what have we talked about? I shared a story of my life where I fell asleep spiritually, where I fell into sin, and where I died spiritually, where, where I was a tree without fruit. But Jesus, just like Paul in this story, came and took me up, breathed life back into me, and said, fear not, for life is yet in him. We talked about the gospel, the gospel of Jesus and the love of a father. I invite you today, if, if, you, if you don't know him and you feel in your heart the, the spirit, the longing for, for an intimate relationship with a holy God, would you come pray? If you've lived a, a Christian life, but you don't know about the power of the presence of God, would you come and pray? Jesus, I thank you for this day, Father. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the character of Eutychus. That before this, I, we didn't even know his name. Thank you for the things that you continue to show us, Father. Lord, I 
I pray for this church, Lord. I pray that this church would be a surrendered church. I pray that this church would be an empowered church, Lord, empowered by the Holy Spirit.